Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another webinar at the National Library of Scotland. My name is Kenny Redpath, and I'm the Events Officer at the Library. Tonight, I'm delighted to be introducing Professor Jerry Crothers and Dr Ronnie Young, who are here tonight to give us the third annual Thomas Muir Lecture, entitled Thomas Muir of Huntersville on Slavery, a Rediscovered Legal Thesis. Jerry Crothers is Francis Hutchison Professor of Scottish Literature at the University of Glasgow. He is General Editor of the Oxford University Press edition of the Collected Works of Robert Burns and also works on Tom Thomas Muir, among other 18th century topics. Ronnie Young is lecture lecturer in the Scottish Enlightenment at the University of Glasgow where he teaches in Scottish literature. In addition to working with Professor Crothers on a newly scholarly edition of the letters of Robert Burns, he has published on Thomas Muir's early education and is a co-organiser of the new annual Thomas Muir lecture series. Now, before I hand over to Ronnie and then Jerry, can I just say a couple of things? Firstly, we will be running a poll through the webinar. So please, if you can, join in with that. Also, just to say that there will be time for questions at the end of the webinar. So get thinking and just type your questions into the Q&A function and we will do our very best to get through as many of those as we can. But for now, over to you, Ronnie and Jerry. Thank you, Kenny. Good evening, all. I'm just, I just want to wish you a, a warm welcome to the 2020 Thomas Muir Lecture on Democracy and Civil Society. I'm absolutely delighted to be here, courtesy of our friends at the National Library of Scotland, and to have the opportunity to introduce Jerry and tonight's event. Um, I just wanted, before we begin, can I just say a wee bit about our lecture series? The Muir Lecture on Democracy and Civil Society is an annual lecture series named, of course, in commemoration of Thomas Muir of Hunters Hill. And a, if you're completely new to Muir, um, we find more out, out, out about him tonight, but Muir is the Glasgow-born martyr and reputed father of Scottish democracy. He's a former student of my university, University of Glasgow, where Jerry and I are based, uh, but also a child of Edinburgh in many ways. He came to Edinburgh to complete his studies, uh, and Muir, of course, was actively involved in the reform movement of the 18th century Scotland and his activities in the Friends of the People led to his trial, his uh, trial for sedition, exile to Botany Bay, and some really quite romantic escapades as he escaped from Botany Bay and ended up eventually in France. Now, uh, we'll say more about Muir in the, or Jerry will, during the talk. Uh, I just want to say that we, we are a relatively new lecture series. In fact, this is only our uh, second year that we ran this event. Uh, our inaugural lecture was only delivered last November by Professor Son Sir Tom Devine in the Kelvin Hall in Glasgow, back in the days when we were actually allowed to have public events in, in public halls. Uh, and uh, to be honest, I think last November now seems like a different time entirely. Uh, of course, we're not in a position tonight to get together in person to commemorate Muir this year. But on the plus side, Zoom and being here on Zoom, uh, courtesy of our friends at the National Library, allows us to reach out and bring together people from all across the world. And I'm really delighted to see so many of you here tonight from so many different parts of the globe. We've got people from everywhere from North America through to New Zealand and Australia. Um, so just my thanks to the National Library of Scotland for organising the talk tonight, to Kenny and Joanne and colleagues. Quick shout out also to the Centre for Scottish and Celtic Studies at Glasgow for supporting this event, and also to the Friends of Thomas Muir, a, an association who have done much to bring Muir back to public notice and to help set up this lecture series. So, as well as commemorating Muir, our lecture series aims to highlight traditions of democratic thought in Scotland as they link with the wider world. And some of the aims are to examine the history of political reform as viewed from through Scottish civic life, but also to consider pre present challenges to democracy and civil society. And I think you'll agree there are many such challenges in today's society. Um, so Professor Carlos talk tonight is going to, his talk tonight is going to look at various areas of current concern, including the legacy of slavery as it impacts upon Scotland through the rediscovery of important material related to Europe. So with that, I'm going to welcome Jerry Crowles, and Jerry's going to talk to us 
about Thomas Muir's lost faculty of advocates thesis. Over to you, Jerry. Thank you very much, Ronnie. Um, uh, thank you, Kenny, and also Joe in the background at the National Library of Scotland. Um, delighted to be giving this lecture tonight, the NLS series of talks that this is part of, and also the Centre for Scottish and Celtic Studies at the University of Glasgow, it's been running a series, shows that the silver lining to this uh, new normality is that we can indeed uh, reach out to people worldwide and um, bring together people for interesting talks. Hopefully my talk tonight will be of some interest. I think it will be, not because of me, but because Thomas Muir is endlessly fascinating. And um, as Kenny has indicated already, this is a talk about Thomas Muir on the subject of slavery, which I'm going to take a fairly um, leisurely run towards, and then I'll be sprinting by the end, I think. And Martin Jones, my colleague Martin Jones, who is a lawyer, he and I have been working on Thomas Muir's uh, lost faculty of advocates thesis on the subject of slavery, written in Muir's late 20s. Um, and of course, as in all kind of uh, sleight of hand situations, it wasn't lost at all. People had been looking in the wrong place, even though it had been catalogued via the NLS um, and via the Faculty of Advocates, people hadn't been looking for it. And I'm going to touch on some of the reasons tonight why I think that was the case. Martin and I have been working, uh, as I say, for several years on this. We've got sort of um, provisional ideas and some solid ideas about it. Uh, but we're looking to develop this and hopefully with the permission of the faculty, publish the thing. It's only a few thousand words in length, translated from Latin. And John Cairns at Edinburgh and Ernie Metzger at Glasgow have been very helpful to us here in helping us with the translation and to shape our ideas. And uh, Alistair Johnson um, has uh, helped us find the, the, the thesis which was purportedly lost. Part of the reason that uh, previous Muir scholars didn't really look at this thesis was because they didn't really bother to look at Muir's legal career. Muir's legal career is fairly well known in outline, but it seems to be not all that sexy until we get to the 1793 trial for sedition, which is pretty much a trumped up trial. Uh, but as Ronnie has mentioned, Muir ends up being uh, sentenced to 14 years in Botany Bay. A rigged trial, as I say, but we should get this in perspective. If I had been British intelligence in that time, I would have been worried about Thomas Muir. Muir was consorting with the United Irishmen, with French revolutionaries, and indeed he was spreading the ideas of Thomas Paine. These were things that would make any British government in the 1790s blanch. What we have to realise is uh, a bit of background to Muir's career um, in terms of his political and religious formation uh, as well as his legal formation. Again, Ronnie's mentioned this epithet, the father of Scottish democracy, which actually in some ways we've never properly examined. It's kicked around a lot in rather one-dimensional fashion, but um, I think we've still to properly gauge that, still to properly test that in some ways. And I'm going to make a few suggestions tonight about how we might perhaps do that. Uh, what we see on the slide here is uh, the home of the Muirs, Hunters Hill, to the north of Glasgow in present day Eastern Bartonshire. Muir born into a merchant family. His father James was a hop merchant, among other things. And it's uh, therefore entirely natural that this boy growing up in the north of the city should, at the age of 11 or 12, go to the University of Glasgow, not entirely untypical uh, in, th in those days. Um, and uh, basically by the time he is 17, um, he uh, is becoming a student of divinity. He clearly has in mind um, studying for the Presbyterian church. Um, but he ends up going off to study law instead. 
Um, he switches direction after graduating with an MA. And there are two people under whose wing he particularly comes at Glasgow. One of these is John Miller, a uh, professor of law, who, who is very influential on Muir in terms of political ideas. We'll come back to Miller a wee bit. And the other man is John Anderson, um, a man who had successively been professor of Oriental languages uh, and then of natural philosophy or physics, as we would call it today. Anderson was a bona fide madman, on one occasion chasing students with a spike. You're not allowed to do that anymore. On another occasion, brawling in the street with the professor of divinity. Nonetheless, he was a man of sincere religious conviction. He was an old licht or traditional Calvinist, and it was very much under his wing that Muir uh, came as part of a group of young quite hardline Calvinists um, who didn't like the backsliding moderate Presbyterianism that they saw around them at the University of Glasgow. And we're going to see a bit more about that. For about 30 years, Anderson had a real beef with successive principals and senior members of the University of Glasgow. And this reaches ahead in 1784, where he accuses the rector, Edmund Buck, uh, the principal um, and senior members of the Senate of financial maladministration. The whole situation is kind of murky, but what is going on to some extent is that Anderson thinks that uh, Glasgow University isn't hard line enough in its Calvinism. This incidentally is why Anderson leaves in his will the money to found what is the modern day University of Strathclyde, which he says in his will should be a place of useful learning. That's a slogan that Strathclyde rightly dines out on. But what they don't mention is that also in the will, Anderson says that Strathclyde should be a seminary of sound learning and religion. In other words, it should be the hardline Calvinist place that the University of Glasgow uh, is no longer as Anderson sees it. This dispute uh, becomes very bitter and uh, the moderates against the popular party or the conservatives um, have students and others uh, falling into line behind them and it reaches ahead um, in going to the court of session in legal action of various kinds. We don't really want to go into that just now. But as a result of that, Thomas Muir ends up self-excluding himself because there have been scurrilous attacks on senior members of the university, which have made it into the newspapers. And Muir and his group are quite clearly complicit in that material getting in to the newspapers. As a result, Muir leaves Glasgow, matriculates at the University of Edinburgh, and eventually is admitted to the Faculty of Advocates in 1787. And I'm going to be telling something of that um, story this evening um, and the thesis that is part of his admission to the faculty. There on the slide is uh, part of the old Glasgow College, the old University of Glasgow when it was in the high street before it transports in uh, the mid 19th century to Gilmore Hill in the leafy West End where it stands today. Um, the iconography of Thomas Muir is quite interesting. Um, here we see a very wonderful bust by Alexander Stoddart. We've got the fine painting in the center by uh, Ken Curry. And then we also have a chalk drawing done in 1790 by David Martin. Um, and all of the, 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 these images, well, the first two images anyway, tend to show us Muir, the man whose face has been partly blown off in a naval engagement when he's been returning from South America to Europe and his ship is intercepted by the Royal Navy and um, a, a sea battle ensues. And that image of Muir as the rather romantic um, desperado perhaps is something that's kind of stuck. More contemporary is that third image that I've mentioned by David Martin. Uh, Martin is a very interesting um, painter 
He's one of the people who forms our canonical view of the Scottish Enlightenment. He provides portraits of David Hume, Joseph Black, other greats in the Enlightenment. And we really don't know enough about the story behind this contemporary drawing. But in it, we have a rather more effete, perhaps sensitive Thomas Muir, who is clearly living a different kind of life, I would suggest, in Edinburgh to come to the notice of Martin uh, and to be, to be drawn by him. Quite interesting. There's still a story there to be uncovered. Um, this is uh, Muir a couple of years, a few years after he's been admitted to the Faculty um, of Advocates. But these images, this iconography of Muir is interesting. Muir um, has kind of flickered in and out of Scottish and international history for various reasons that we might go into um, to, 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 to some extent um, uh, as, as we go along. Uh, part of the reason that he falls out of the canon of respectable radicals, if you like, is the thing I've touched on already. He is seen as ultimately a bit dangerous. He is someone who becomes in today's parlance increasingly radicalized. Um, and so we should be careful about what we do with the legacy here, about how we discuss it, because Muir might well be the father of Scottish democracy, but certainly by about 1794, 95, he believes in revolutionary force in Britain. We'll park that idea there just now. Now, Thomas Muir of Hunters Hill has not been particularly well served by biographers, etc. It's a bit like Robert Burns. Too many people write biographies of Burns and the same for Muir that end up essentially being novels. And indeed, there are too many novels about Burns and Muir that pe where people think they're reading real historical matter or real biography. In 1981, Christina Bewley's Muir of Hunters Hill, published by Oxford University Press, is quite a decent attempt at a biography, but what is remarkable is that it misses out almost completely Muir's legal career, and it doesn't go to the sources. In recent years, I've been falling over the legal sources as I work uh, again with Martin Jones on a particular legal case um, at Cadder Kirk, where Muir um, and his faction um, are at uh, loggerheads with another faction over the appointment of the minister. And we can, what we find there are the Court of Session papers, because it goes to the Court of Session. We can also find Church of Scotland, Presbytery Minutes, General Assembly, Assembly reports, material in the newspapers, virtually untouched by biographers and historians of Muir because they've been in such a hurry to get to the sexy trial of 17. 93. There is more stuff out there than we think. That's been the pattern of the last three or four or, or five years. And I mentioned already that Muir had thought of training for the ministry. I mentioned too that he was under the influence of John Anderson, part of the conservative Calvinist faction. And this pattern is repeated, both in the Cadder Kirk case that I'm not going to say much about tonight, and also the McGill case that I'm going to say just a wee bit more about for a moment. William McGill was minister at Ayr. He was a great friend of Robert Burns. And in 1786, he publishes his practical essay on the death of Jesus Christ. And the uh, conservative Calvinists attempt to have McGill done for heresy. And McGill is very much associated with the moderates at the University of Glasgow. So the moderates via the popular party at Glasgow, this is something that carries on into the Cadder Kirk case and then into the McGill case. And there ensues a pamphlet war and the main counsel on behalf of the Conservatives who want McGill done for heresy is Thomas Muir of Hunters Hill. And part of their main beef is that in McGill's practical essay on the death of Jesus Christ, they feel that McGill has not paid enough attention to, uh, in an orthodox way, to the doctrine of the Trinity and to um, salvation. Uh, what they really want is orthodox Calvinist religion. And McGill had been given an honorary degree by the University of Glasgow in 1785, 
before publishing his practical essay on the death of Jesus Christ. So what we very much see is a man who is part of that moderate party at the University of Glasgow that Muir stands in opposition to. Some of this material uh, has been a bit unearthed in a collection of essays that Don Martin and I published in 2016, Thomas Muir of Hunters Hill, Essays for the 21st Century. And Ken Curry has allowed us to very kindly to use his portrait um, of Muir on the cover. The interesting thing about Ken's portrait is it begins to picture something of the religious identity of Thomas Muir, which I think needs restored. Uh, because what we get here to a large extent is a passion narrative. Um, this is Muir, as it were, like Christ before, Pontius Pilate, scourged, uh, almost the sense of a crown of thorns um, with the bandages and, and the eye patch and so on. And I think this is quite important. Uh, Martin and I have made quite a good team, Martin Jones and I working on this. He's a cab carrying Calvinist uh, and I'm a practicing Roman Catholic. And the one thing at least that we have in common is that we believe that historical narratives in Scotland have been too secular, not because we want to make them religious, but because religious identity in Scotland and indeed in much of the Western world is more important than any other identity, arguably down to the 1920s at least, and perhaps even beyond. So what I'm slowly doing here before I get to the really good stuff, I hope it's the really good stuff, I know it's the really good stuff, is beginning to suggest that we've got to be aware of Muir's religious identity because it becomes quite important in what I'm going to tell you about his um, thesis on slavery. Now, essentially, um, in the late 18th century, aspirants to the Faculty of Advocates would write a thesis in Latin. If you were particularly lazy or particularly moneyed or both, you might actually pay someone to write these for you. Um, or you might more or less plagiarise them, I think. Uh, God forgive me if there are any lawyers um, with us tonight. Uh, that's the kind of thing that would, would never happen um, these days. Um, these theses basically were the kind of the part of the final road uh, for a young man aspiring to enter the Faculty of Advocates. And Muir's thesis, which we're going to have to do some more work on and compare to other theses and see what's going on, uh, published, as it were, printed and published 1787, is dedicated um, to Henry uh, Erskine, the Dean of the Faculty of Advocates. And interestingly, Erskine, when Muir comes to trial in 1793, offers to defend Muir. But Muir says, no, um, I'm going to defend myself. And OK, he had legal training. But part of the narrative there, or one way of reading this, is to suggest that he was giving himself up as uh, a sacrifice, uh, was seeing himself in Christian terms that there was something here where he had to surrender to his fate and that there was perhaps no point in defending himself, really, although he did at least go through the motions. Various ways of interpreting that, but slightly odd not to avail yourself of the offer from Henry Erskine, who was reputedly the best pleader in Scotland in his day, um, a man who may well have saved Muir from his fate of transportation. Anyway, this thesis um, dedicated to um, Henry Erskine. Uh, there's Erskine there. Um, like all these theses, the basic drill was that you had to discourse on Roman law, the basis of civil law um, in much of the West. And uh, this Roman law was based on Justinian's digest, the emperor. Justinian had attempted to codify, to set out law in 50 volumes, and your aspirant advocate would be given a text, a part of a text, a passage from uh, Justinian's digest and be expected to pass that or to, um, to write about it um, in legal terms and then be examined on that publicly, at least in some cases, and if successful, you would be admitted 
to the faculty. Um, the minutes for Thomas Muir uh, undertaking this process can be found in volume 53 of the Stair Society volume edited by Stuart and Pratt. It's a very interesting um, bit of work with more detail than I can go into tonight. But the minute which we find there records that Thomas Muir, uh, son of James Muir Merchant in Glasgow, is to be examined um, particularly on something that he's to write a discourse on. And that discourse is basically the idea that if your slave, you're the master, and if your slave has committed theft, um, what happens in that case? And part of the orthodoxy here, according to Roman law, was that you, the master of the slave, um, could, of course, um, repay the person who had been stolen from. You might also surrender up um, the slave to the injured party. So that's the basis upon which Muir was being examined, passage um, from uh, Justinian. Now, when we begin to explore the ideas, um, some interesting things emerge that seem to suggest that Muir is indeed, in a very individuated way, um, providing his own ideas to a large extent. And we can see some of the enlightenment underfelt to this and some of the influence of his teachers at Glasgow and also at Edinburgh, I would suggest. One of the things that Muir is quite strong on is that slavery is a physical state where power is exercised over the week. And what we think is going on is that this is echoing the teaching of Adam Smith, who was also a teacher to John Miller, who taught Muir. And Smith, in his lectures on jurisprudence, jurisprudence um, says that the love of domination over others, um, he talks of that and says, I'm afraid this is very natural to mankind. And this is also where, to some extent, we might notice that Adam Smith is also a pioneer of psychology in some ways. But that's the first of five ideas that I want very basically, very briefly to outline. Muir is insistent that slavery is a physical state, and we should be aware of this. This might seem very obvious, but he's quite insistent. It's a physical state in which the powerful control the weak or the inferior. A second idea that um, is being advanced by Muir is that no proper moral system can justify slavery at all. It's repugnant to any reasonable moral system, and it's repugnant, most certainly, Muir says, to Christianity. Now, why should he have to say that uh, no moral uh, system can justify slavery? Well, maybe no surprise in some ways, this was not universally held in 18th century Scotland or in the, the 18th century Western world. We have the case of uh, Knight versus Wedderburn, um, commemorated, written about by James Robertson in his novel, Joseph Knight. Basically, um, Joseph Knight had been a slave bought by John Wedderburn um, in Jamaica, brought back to Scotland, educated by Wedderburn. In Wedderburn's eyes, he had um, very much done well by Knight, but when he refused Knight, uh, permission to marry another um, servant and live with her, with his family, uh, Knight basically left his service. And Weatherburn was very miffed and hurt by this and took it to court in Perth. And to begin with, Weatherburn won his case. Basically, um, he was told, yep, uh, Knight has done you wrong. This then is overturned by the principal sheriff who says that the laws of Jamaica don't apply to the laws of Scotland. That's a different legal system. So they're still arguing actually about legal nicety rather than morality. And eventually it reaches the court of session where interestingly, Knight's counsel is, is one Henry Dundas. We'll pass over that for just now. And essentially at the court of session, Knight, 
Its case is won by only only by eight votes to four. To four. Um, slavery isn't recognised by the laws of this kingdom, is the judgment. Uh, but still, in that vote eight to four, it's quite clear that the establishment has a difference of opinion. And it's not simply a moral case, it's a legal case. Uh, interestingly, James Boswell, who was part of Knight's team, um, his father, Lord Auchinleck, who comes from the stable of conservative Calvinism, he's one of the first people to issue a kind of clarion call that says, the black man is the brother of the white man and absolutely nothing can justify slavery. And this is part of a long tradition of conservative Calvinism being outraged by being opposed to slavery that, um, that we should notice. We'll come back to that presently. A third idea that is advanced by Muir, and this is where we see him getting a bit bullshy, a bit radical, he says that the Roman law and slavery presents a horrendous spectacle. And not only that, he says that the Justinian's Digest, um, the book or the passage from the book that he's been examined upon, writing on and to be, to be examined on, Justinian's Digest itself keeps alive that spectacle. This is mere turning on the very legal books and beginning to say, we need to break out of this legal discussion and do something else. We need actually to have a moral discussion. What we have um, for a long time, and this isn't properly grasped, I think, by people who write about slavery, in Scotland, in Britain, in the West, but especially in the British Isles, Going back at least to the 17th century, we have long-standing debates about liberty in general, about subjectness, and um, about the rights that we owe to masters, whether they be kings or magistrates or politicians or whatever. And there's a big debate through the 17th and into the 18th century about what to do with slavery. People kind of do know that it's not a good thing. But what's going to what's going to make it uh, redundant? You know how how ultimately is it going to be banned? Some people argued that Christianity would clearly, at some point, um, show us that slavery was wrong. But as others pointed out, well, you've had a bit by this time, eighteen hundred years of Christianity, and it ain't happened yet. Slavery is still with us. John Miller and Adam Smith both believed economic progress would do away with slavery. Um, and Miller especially had harsh things to say about the failure of Christianity in this re regard. You can't trust Christianity, says Miller. It's going to have to be liberal economic progress that's going to show us that slavery is a bad thing. Going back before the time of Miller and Smith into Scottish jurists of the 17th century, Lord Stair in 1681, says basically that um, slavery has mostly been done away with, especially by the Britons, he says. Um, it only really exists in those swarthy southern nations that are closer to the Turks, those untrustworthy Spaniards, Portuguese, Italians, etc. So there's a bit of casual racism going on there and a bit of British exceptionalism, uh, the Britons particularly owning that idea of liberty. A very different figure from the Whiggish Lord Stair is George Mackenzie, the scourge of uh, the Covenanters, etc., who also says in the late 17th century, we've little use in Scotland uh, of what the institutions of Roman law teach, for we as Christians allow no men to be slaves, that being contrary to Christian liberty. So people are worrying away about this problem for a long time. Uh, but not quite solving it. And I think actually, to be fair to Thomas Muir, one place where I very much admire him is he is very fed up that Christianity seems not to be making the breakthrough and abolishing slavery in spite of the fact that there are a number of statements suggesting that Christianity should solve the problem. There's John Miller there, um, and he particularly 
uh, observed society, power relations, the fact that Christianity isn't doing the job with slavery in his essay on the distinction of ranks in society, quite a famous um, text. Now, something else I want to throw into the mix. I've bored many of the people here tonight on this before. The great lost genius of the Scottish Enlightenment, Father Alexander Geddes, the radical Catholic priest, who publishes in 1792 his satirical pamphlet, An Apology for Slavery, which has very much come back onto the radar of mainstream romantic literary studies over the past 10 years. It is what a text. It is Swiftian, it's satirical, it's vicious. It is couched in the voice of someone saying that we can't do away with slavery. It's dedicated to Colonel, Colonel Tarleton, who was a soldier, a politician, uh, a man who exercises a lot of power in Britain into the 19th century. He's painted by both Reynolds and by Gainsborough. Now that is quite interesting in telling you how these views are at the mainstream of British society. Um, so Geddes, Mock dedicates it to Tarleton and then in this satiric voice goes on to say, well, you know, people who say we should do away with slavery say it's contrary to nature. Tush, says Geddes' narrator, nature is brutal. And then he goes on to say, in a kind of deliberately um, contradictory, messy way, in any case, we may say of nature what a, an apostle says of God, no one has ever seen her. There's all kinds of strange things going on in this text, but ultimately Geddes, the Catholic priest, is saying that those who would argue for slavery are on Christian, and it doesn't matter a damn that the law might actually technically be on their side, and that the economic laws might be argued to be on their side. All of this should wither in the face of Christianity. Geddes, like Muir, is advancing this idea in the late 18th century, Actually, if we pay attention to Christianity, it should tell us that slavery is simply wrong and don't bore me with laws and economic arguments, etc., etc. So this is a few years after Muir's thesis, but we should be aware of this intellectual current of thinking, this Christian strand against slavery. And not for nothing is the Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade formed in 22nd of May, 1787. So right in the background to Muir's thesis on slavery. Okay, it may be about slavery in the classical world, which might or might not involve African slaves, but the presentist concern of Muir when he's writing his thesis quite clearly, contextually, is the abolition of the slave trade um, in, his, in his own day. Um, and what we, 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 we have here, we've got we get three individuals, we've got Granville Sharp, we've got Thompson Clark and William Wilberforce, all with a very strong Christian principle. So something is happening in the enlightened world uh, where Christianity is mobilizing its moral force against slavery. And I would suggest to you that Muir's thesis makes sense in that context. Something else where we pick up on, if you like, the covenanting tradition of Christianity, of conservative Calvinism in Muir, which I've mentioned briefly in relation to uh, Lord Auchinleck, James Boswell's father, is something else that Martin and I think is going on. We think that Muir is probably reading Samuel Rutherford, who was a Presbyterian divine of the late 17th century, uh, part of the Westminster Commission, who hoped that the whole ecclesiastical government of Britain might become um, Presbyterian. And Samuel Rutherford publishes in 1644 his Lex Rex, or Law and the Princes Law, um, basically talking about the extent to which people can demand duties from their subjects or from people uh, that they have power over. Um, Imo in conditionem brutorum animantium depressit, we think is the particular text that Muir is echoing. Um, and this is the idea of being no better than a brute beast that we get in the law and the prince. And basically what Rutherford was saying was, if we obey kings, there's proto-republicanism going on here, if we obey kings, etc., we become no better 
than brute beasts. So this whole political discourse is also there in the background. At the restoration, no surprise, Rutherford's Lex Rex was burned at the town cross in both Edinburgh and St Andrews because these were rel dangerous religious Presbyterian Republican ideas. Um, and that I think they're there in, in, in Muir's um, thesis, but we're going to have to do a bit more work on that. Almost certainly Muir is aware, is aware of Rutherford. This is part of the intellectual underfelt. Then the other thing that I think we've got going on in the background to Muir's thesis uh, only a few years before is the so-called Zong massacre when uh, because a particular ship was running low in fresh water they threw the black slave cargo in inverted commas into the water um, and the owners had the cheek to claim the insurance on this uh, there's the famous uh, Gregson versus Gilchrist court case in 1783 about this. And this has a whole sequence of legal ram ramifications. Um, one judge, as the case is passing through his hand, says, well, the jury will, of course, be upset by this. It is upsetting. Uh, but really, you know, slaves being thrown overboard. This is a bit like horses being thrown overboard um, to... To, to, to preserve the, the fresh water for, 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 for the crew. So this is the kind of calloused thinking that we've still going, got going on in the law. And quite clearly, Muir is cavilling against this. It's making his hackles rise. This is why we get quite strong pronouncements from Muir. This is not off the peg stuff, um, as he argues that slavery is on Christian um, it's brutish and it cannot be accommodated to any set of moral laws at all. Here is another case where we see Thomas Muir's radicalism in a way that's never properly been seen before, apropos his Calvinist beliefs and apropos the slavery issue, which has been almost unexamined in terms of Muir's career. This is something that we now need to grasp more fully to realise both his radical political CV and his Christian beliefs. The minutes record that on the 27th of November 1787, Muir was admitted to the Faculty of Advocates on the basis of this successful thesis and his defence of it. And following that, we've got the rather sad history leading down to the political trial of 1793, transportation, Exile from Britain, death in France, but that's another story for another day. Thank you for your kind attention.